Welcome everyone to our Sunday worship. We're going to begin with a song of worship of Jesus acknowledging that he is Lord of life and King of Kings. He is Lord. up some of the themes from what we've just been singing let's bring our prayers now to God for the life of this world let us pray Jesus Christ you are king of all nations you are the ruler supreme you have the name above all names and yet the nations of this world have still not acknowledged your reign. The nations of this world are still at war, in conflict with one another. There is still bad leadership, oppression and hardship. And we pray for peace in our world. Be the king that we long you to be, the king that is the supreme ruler. May your leadership transform our world and transform the nations. Bring peace, O great King, we pray. Lord Jesus, you are love. In you we see the love of God expressed most clearly. And we all need love in our life. We pray for loving relationships within families, between individuals, between communities and nations. Help us to learn to love one another as you love us. Help us to look after one another and care for one another. And we pray for homes where there is tension or disagreement or even hatred and violence and we pray that love may conquer all. Lord Jesus, you are Lord of life, and we pray for life in all its fullness. Bring help to those whose lives are spoiled through disease, through great anxiety or distress. Be with all those whose lives are not as they should be. Bring your life, Lord, we pray. Bring healing, hope, health of body and mind and spirit. Lord, we pray that you will be 
for this world, for those we love, and for us, our great Lord, our King, our love, our life. In your name we pray. Amen. And let's join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you are in the habit of watching these videos, you will remember that last week I began a sermon which I had way too much material for, so I left half of it till this week. The theme of my sermon was uh, the teaching of Jesus. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. The first two parts of that are statements of fact. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. If you didn't yet uh, watch what I said about those, the video is still available, go and watch last week's video. But now I'm going to look at the other two. And these are what in grammar terms are called imperatives. They are orders to do something. Repent, believe the good news. But before we actually do look at those two themes, let's put them back into context by reading once again the passage from Mark's Gospel, where, oh, never mind. Are we back again? Right, I've tightened up the camera stand, hopefully enough to stop it swivelling. Let's see, if I pull on the lead here, ah, there we are. Only swivels a little bit. We'll crack on. Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 to 20. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Thanks be to God. So, two themes for today. Repent and believe the good news. The idea of repenting is often associated with being sorry for something we've done. For example, there is the story of the painter and decorator just setting out on his career who decided that he could save money by adding water to the, the paint uh, and it would therefore go further but of course it was too thin and when it dried it looked horrible so he looked up to heaven and cried out what shall I do and a voice from heaven responded 
repaint, repaint, and thin no more. And that does capture something of the essence of what repentance is, because it's not just about being sorry for what you've done, but it's about not doing it again. It's about changing your lifestyle. The fisherman in the story that I have read from Mark had a complete change of their lifestyle. The phrase that I read from in uh, the New International Version and the slightly old version used the words of Jesus, I will make you fishers of men. These days, many translations would have fishers of people, which I know is more inclusive in its language. It never sounds quite right to me, but it is better than some translations which have tried to get round what's an unusual word these days, fisher. Not a common word, we know what it is, someone who fishes, but some of the modern translations will change the words, for example, in the Good News Bible, it says, uh, come, come with me, I will teach you to catch people. Actually, it says to catch men. Again, it's an older translation. But I will teach you to catch people. Or another translation I came across with is, I will make you fish for people. But that's not quite right. If you go to the Greek, even the word fisherman, which appears earlier on, isn't quite right. It's simply the same word as later, fishers. A proper translation would be that Andrew and Simon were working at their nets because they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. The same word repeated, but not just fishers, fishers of people. There's a subtle difference between I will make you fishers of people and I will make you fish for people. One is about the actions that you're doing. The other is about who you are. Jesus was not calling them to do extra stuff. He wasn't giving them a task to do. He was calling them to be someone different. Now, I know there is a uh, a correspondence between who you are and what you do. They're not entirely different. But there is a, a difference. I'm reminded of one of the characters in the old comedy series, Cheers, uh, Cliff Clavin, who was um, a postman, or I suppose a mailman um, in America, uh, and very proud of the fact and you knew he was a postman, not because you saw him delivering letters, but because he, he wore the uniform and he talked about it almost incessantly. He was very proud to be a member of the uh, US Postal Service and the, the proud tradition that that ha held and the kind of character of, of men that were such people. Um, Part of the comedy was that actually, I, I don't think the US Postal Service has quite the high standards maybe, or the, um, the kudos that he gave to it. But in his mind, it was who he was, not just a job that he did. It was who he was at the very core of his being. A better example, maybe something that is happening um, this Sunday, we are, uh, in our circuit welcoming uh, a new local preacher. And it's wonderful to see someone who has done the training and she is now being fully welcomed as a preacher. But we're not just giving her work to do. This is acknowledging that she is becoming someone new, someone different. She is becoming a preacher in response to the call of God. When uh, you go through the process of being a local preacher, you are reminded of the, the duties and responsibilities. Oh, we're still, we're still swivelling around, aren't we? You are reminded 
of the duties and responsibilities from the constitutional practice and discipline of the Methodist Church. And there's a, there's a list in here. And yes, there are things you've got to do. You ob obviously are expected to lead worship competently. But right at the beginning, it, it begins before any of the tasks are listed, preachers are called of God to be worthy in character to lead God's people in worship and to preach the gospel. The first thing of all is to be worthy in character. It's about being someone different. It's about who you are and not just what you, you are going to do. So I'm going to pause and try and adjust this camera, which is swiveling like nobody's business and I don't know why. Right. The key point I'm trying to get across is that being a preacher is, is someone who you are, not just what you do. So, and other preachers who are watching this will know this, once you are a preacher, everything in life is grist to the mill. You, you watch a television programme or something happens or you read something in a book and you're thinking, oh, I can use that, not just as a a sermon illustration, although that sometimes might be the case, but, but it helps to inform you as to what God might be saying. You, you have to have your ears open all the time to what God is saying and what God is doing in the world so that you can actually share that with others. It's a full-time calling to be a preacher. And it's also something that um, makes an impression on other people. A lot of our preachers um, are retired now, admittedly, from work, and some have gone on to become ordained ministers. But there are preachers who are still in work and still uh, have a, a life outside the preaching. And yet, even in a work situation, if they're known to be a, a Methodist local preacher, what they do how they behave, the attitudes they have, all reflects either well or badly on the Methodist Church and ultimately on Jesus. You can't stop being a preacher at all. It's who you are. And the same can be said of what it means to, to become a follower of Jesus. Let, let me share a brief part of my own testimony. As a, a teenager, uh, there was a, a, a night or an evening uh, when I was in bed reading a little booklet. I've still got it. Journey into Life uh, by Norman Warren. And for some reason, this particular booklet really made sense to me. Uh, it's very simple illustrations, uh, a very basic telling of the gospel, which I, I'm not sure I would use these words th today to explain to somebody else, but it meant a lot to me. And there's a prayer. And I said the prayer. And the very last thing, there was words written afterwards, but the very last thing it tells you that once you've said that prayer, tell one other person within the next 24 hours what you have done. That terrified me. But I was determined, if I was going to follow this through, to do what it said. The next day happened to be a Sunday. So after the, the morning service at the church, I took my Sunday school teacher just to one side and I, I said, I've got something to tell you. Um, last night, I asked Jesus Christ into my life as my Lord and Saviour. And I breathed a sigh of relief. That was a, a load off my shoulders that I'd, I'd, I'd steeled myself up to the point and, and said what I had to say. <sighs> what a relief. But to my dismay, to my dismay, you noticed a little wobble there. That's nothing to do with me. Camera again. Oh, we're having camera problems today. To my dismay, 
the very next thing that this Sunday school teacher did was grab someone else, another teenager, and, and say, Paul, tell him what you've just told me. And I had to think, oh no, I, I, I'm not sure I can say that again. But I suddenly found myself saying to this friend, I've become a Christian. And you know how thoughts can go for, through your mind very rapidly at, uh, sometimes. And, and two thoughts rapidly went through my mind. One was gratitude, that I felt God had given me a form of words that was shorter and less clumsy and less pretentious sounding than I have asked the Lord Jesus into my life as my Lord and Saviour. So it was simpler to say. But the other thought was, oh, yeah, that's what a Christian is, isn't it? I hadn't quite made the connection somehow that being a Christian was saying that prayer and asking Christ into your life and becoming a different person as a result. Well, 45 years and more later, um, looking back at that moment in my life, I've realised that it's actually a, a good illustration of the point I'm trying to make today. That it's not just about doing something, it's about being someone, becoming a Christian, becoming a different person, not taking on new tasks, not taking on new responsibilities, but being someone different. And I think this is what repentance is about. Yes, sometimes it will involve a, a total transformation, a total change of direction, because you've been going far astray, but it involves becoming a new and different person. And why do I need to call you to repent today, you who are watching this? Because you may have changed who you are long ago. You may have become a Christian long ago, and you now are a follower of Jesus. What need is there now for you to repent? You can't keep changing direction, can you? It makes sense if you're heading one way and you realise it's the wrong way, then it makes sense to turn around. I'm going to see if I can do this without pulling on the camera again. Let's, let's give it a go. You're going in one direction, you turn around, you repent, you're going the other direction, but you can't repent again and turn around and then repent again and turn around and repent once more. You're not going to get anywhere like this if you're always changing your direction once you've made a complete turnaround and you're going in the right direction, maybe the, the thing we need to do is simply keep on track. Sometimes we can start to, to veer off to one side or the other and we need to focus back, fix our eyes on Jesus, make sure we're heading in the right direction. And that's what repentance may be for many of us. It's not about a complete transformation of life, but it is about being the person God called you to be. It's about um, owning who you are as a Christian, remembering who you are as a Christian, living that life as a Christian. This is who you are called to be. This is what you should be. So be it. Be a Christian. Forget about the old life and the old self. That's gone. One of the wonders of the Christian faith is that we can begin again literally every day. Every day can be a new day. The person that I was up until yesterday, they're gone, they're finished with. All those experiences, all the things I got right, all the things I got wrong, it's all in the past. Today's a new day. Today it's the new me, it's the new you. You can begin again. That's what repenting is. Becoming who you are meant to be and putting the old self behind. That's not to say that the old self uh, is irrelevant. All those experiences of the past, all the things you've learnt, you can take those on board as you move forward. But you don't have to be that old person. You can be a new person from today. That's the wonder of the, the call to Christian repentance. 
So we're going to move on to believe the good news. Uh, but I thought first I'd, I'd just have a little break. If you want to stand up and stretch, you can. Uh, but we're going to put this in the form of a quiz. This is about belief. So here's some, some facts about my life, or are they facts? Okay. Only two of these three statements below are true. Okay. Which is the false statement? Have a look and see what you think. Okay, have you made your decision? Which of the statements is false? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm going to let you into a secret. I was cheating a little bit. Trick question. This is the false one. Okay, all the other three are true. Anyway, believe the good news. You can sit down now and start to relax again. Believe the good news, said Jesus. I have a slight problem with this, <clears throat> with this idea of being told to believe something. It doesn't quite work for me because it's not something I can choose to do. There are lots of things I do believe because I can't help believing them. And there are things that I don't believe. To quote Victor Meldrew, I don't believe it. Lots of things like that because I can't believe them. A lot of things are straight facts that I just have to believe. I believe, for example, that the earth orbits the sun and not vice versa. I believe that because I've learnt it at school. It makes sense from my own experience of what I see around me. Everyone else seems to believe it. Um, I, I can't not believe it. If you commanded me to believe that the earth was flat, I couldn't do it. I, I'm not like the, um, the, the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland. No, through the looking glass. Get him a fax wrong. Who said that she could believe five impossible things before breakfast? I can't do that. I can't believe what's impossible. It's not a choice I can make. There are things that I'm not a hundred percent sure about that I still believe. For example, I believe that my mother is alive and well and living in Sheffield. I don't know that to be an absolute fact because I, I don't know whether anything might have happened to her since I last spoke to her on the phone. But I suspect if something had happened that someone would have rung me and let me know. So I believe that she's still alive, even though I don't 100% know it to be the case. There are lots of things that I don't believe or I don't disbelieve because I just don't know. Many years ago, as a young minister, I, I used to give pastoral support to a lady whose son was accused of a murder and was in fact convicted of that murder. And to this day, I don't know what to believe. I don't know whether to believe that the court were right in convicting him or to believe that the mother was right, who had some very convincing arguments of why he didn't do it. I don't know. I just have to live with not believing either thing. I'm ambiguous. But I, I can't choose to believe. But I could choose to act as though I believed. If I was commanded to uh, campaign for this boy's innocence, I could choose to do that. It, well, it's too late now, it all happened way long ago, but if at the time I'd been told, you must campaign for this boy's innocence, I could do that, 
I couldn't make myself believe in it. I could simply act as though I believed. That's the best I could do. But why would I even do that? Well, it comes down to a matter of trust. Do you trust the person who's telling you things? If my sister phones up and tells me that she's just been talking to my mother and mum's fine, I believe her because I know my sister to be a trustworthy person. My experience is that she's not going to lie about such things. So I believe her. The disciples were told, believe the good news. And yet it was very early on in the, uh, the ministry of Jesus. They'd not seen any good news, really. They'd not been part of the experience of his, his ministry, his teaching, his healing, all the, the things that were about to happen. But they trusted him enough to follow him and discover that there would be good news still to come. Mark tells us right at the start of his gospel, this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus. And as readers, we see it unfold as we read the gospel. For the disciples, it only unfolded once they'd trusted Jesus enough to go with him and discover for themselves. I don't know what they believed, but they certainly acted as though they believed. These days, there's a lot of bad news around. There's a lot of depressing news day after day in terms of deaths due to the, the COVID-19 virus, the ongoing lockdown, um, the, the date that things might even begin to return to normal seems to be getting later and later. There is lots of bad news, but there is also lots of good news. We do have a vaccine. People are being vaccinated. The, the death rate is dropping, albeit gradually, that there are people in the community working tirelessly and, and wonderfully to help other, other people. Lots of good is happening. We need to believe in that good news. We need to believe that God still cares for us, that God still watches over us. He's not abandoned us. We need to believe that Jesus still is Lord of life and Lord of love and King of the nations. And why should we believe these things? Because Jesus himself commands us to believe and he is trustworthy. He's someone that we can rely on. It might only be that as we commit ourselves to serving him, that that full reliance uh, is established, that we, we discover that we really can trust him but we can at least choose now to act as though we trust him, to act as if there is good news, to act as if Christ really is Lord of life. That's his command to us. Repent, be a different person. Don't be the person that you've been in the past. Be the person that you are meant to be and believe the good news. Rejoice. There's Good things happening all around us. God still looks after us. God still watches over us. God still loves us. Believe that and let that transform your life. Amen. We're going to sing a song which puts some uh, of the verses, well, all the verses more or less, into the words of God. So we sing of God his love for us and his care for us. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I've heard my people's cry. But the chorus is, of course, our response. Here I am, Lord. Let's offer ourselves in service to God as we sing together.
Let us pray. Lord of the years that have gone, we give you thanks for our memories. We praise you for those whose words and deeds led us to the foot of the cross where we met our Saviour, and to the empty tomb where we received him as Lord. Lord of the years still to come, we seek your guiding hand. We long for our faith to grow, our trust to deepen, and our knowledge of you and of your greatness to be the source of our hope for all our tomorrows. Lord of today, we commit ourselves this day to trust you, to serve you, to praise you, to obey you, to love you, now and for all eternity. In Christ's name. Amen. And the blessing of God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon all of you and remain with you forevermore. Amen.